Travis Bader, and this is the Silvercore Podcast. Silvercore has been providing its members with the skills and knowledge necessary to be confident and proficient in the outdoors for over 20 years, and we make it easier for people to deepen their connection to the natural world. If you enjoy the positive and educational content we provide, please let others know by sharing, commenting, and following so that you can join in on everything that Silvercore stands for. If you'd like to learn more about becoming a member of the Silvercore club and community, visit our website at silvercore.ca. Today I'm joined by a retired RAF officer who, among other things, conducted combat survival and rescue training. After 23 years with the RAF, he retired and spent 10 years in Western Canada as a project manager supporting NATO, Canadian, and Australian defense operations in Afghanistan, where he held CSIS top secret security clearance. I'd like to welcome to the Silver Core podcast, David Hutchinson, or as I know him, Hutch. Hi, Travis. I am excited to be speaking with you today. This all happened from a, I guess, a meeting that, uh, past Silver Core outreach coordinator, Nicholas Wong, who hasn't worked at Silver Core for some time, but is still always thinking about myself and the company. And he says, Trav, you got to talk to Hutch. He's got binders of information that he's been collecting and collating and putting together on his thoughts and ideas on tactics and survival and preparedness that would likely be of interest to the Silver Core club members. So figured we'd sit, spend some time today talking a little bit about that. And, um, if the podcast listeners and the club members say, yeah, that's something I want to hear about, then, uh, we can explore going further and looking at what you have. Cause you've, you've put everything together in a way that a British officer would <laughs> in a very well meticulously organized and, and put together fashion, which would make an interesting training program essentially for, for somebody interested in, in preparedness and, and survival. Right. So before we get into that, I kind of want to know a little bit about you and your background. So you grew up in the UK and you always said, Hey, I, I want to, I want to join the RAF or how did that work? No, I actually grew up on a, on a market garden. My father was a, um, ran his own horticultural business. And I seen, it seemed the obvious choice that I would, as the youngest child, the, the only son would take the business on, but my father realized my heart wasn't in working the land in that way mm-hmm. and, uh, and he never pushed me and, uh, I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. So once I'd finished my education, I decided I was going to join the air force. Okay. So how old were you when you joined the air, air force? 19. So you just jumped right into it. Yeah. And what, so you, you did flying with the air force. Yeah, initially I joined as a technician okay. and realized that wasn't for me. It was, uh, it was not the way I was wired. I was in the, I was a square peg in a round hole, Yeah, but I wanted to, uh, I knew I liked the air force. I was enjoying the lifestyle and I, uh, cross trained to become aircrew. I became a, an air load master okay. uh, on heavy lift aircraft. So initially on the C-130. The Herc. Uh, the Herc, the yeah. Herky bird, Fat Albert. I yeah. did that for, uh. For a number of years, and then I went into and flew other other heavy lift aircraft as well, all ten, eleven tri stars and things like that. And so you were also, I think you were saying you did some flying in Canada as well, did you? A lot. So I I was fortunate. One of the big advantages of being on long range transport aircraft is that you get to travel the world. The Queen pays for you to travel around the world and right. see different places. And some places I thought I like this place, and other places I thought I never want to come here again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, they all added to my experience and my knowledge And Canada was somewhere I came to reasonably regularly, both from East coast, right across to the West coast. And I first visited here in BC in 1990 and said, I'm going to live here one day. I knew it was going to happen. Off your very first visit. Very first visit. What was it? It's a combination of things. There was actually a guy I'd been through flying training with, and we were sat at Granville Island for those of you people who know it, sat there having a beer and he said, you're deep in thought, what's going on? And I said, I'm going to live here one day. And he said, what are you talking about? He thought, this was just another night stop or we were here for a few days. 
I said, this has got the right combination of what I want in life. It's got an outdoor lifestyle. We'd been to see David Bowie in concert the night before. Oh, nice. We'd been out for some great meals. We'd been around Stanley Park. We'd been up Grouse Mountain. And I said, this has got a good combination. This is a suitable place for me to come with my with my family. So at that point, you just looked at it and said, hey, this is what I want to do. And you just started, what, putting putting things in motion from there or it just kind of sat yeah. in the back of your head? As no, a, it, it started as a, as a, just an idea, but that was 12 years before I actually came and I really ramped the, the efforts up back in sort of 98, 99. Yeah. That's when I really started attending fairs and doing lots of research and where was I going to be? What was I going to be doing? What, what were my transferable skills? Right. Okay. Yeah. So you, I mean, like you, you could have stayed longer than the 23 years. Yeah. I, I, my, my, I had. Uh, my bosses and even my colleagues are like, you're crazy. Why are you leaving? You're in a very good, well-paid job and you're, you've got progression. You can, can keep going up through the ranks. And, uh, but I, no, I, I decided I wanted to live in Canada. You got to follow your heart. Absolutely. I mean, you've got one life to live. And when you look back, I don't think you want to look back and say, man, I should have, or I could have, or if only if you really got to just jump on those opportunities when you see them. And yeah, so I, and I was fortunate that I had a, a very supportive wife. I should say my late wife. She passed away uh, uh, back in two thousand nine from cancer, but she and my two daughters were yeah okay. Let's go and do it. They came and visited on a couple of vacations and thought, wow, this will be fun. And uh, yeah, what, what a world of a difference it makes when you've got a support network around you that can help you see those goals forward. It was. It was also. It was also challenging because, in many ways, I was leaving my support network that existed in the UK. Right. But my direct support network, my family unit, we were all in support of what we did. Right. So, did you have many acquaintances or friends or family or anyone in Canada, or was this just just jump in and go? I had one second cousin in over on the island, but I, I went to Alberta initially for mm. six years. I knew other people in Ontario. I had uh, knew a few people and acquaintances and some ex-military guys as well that I knew. So I had a couple, but nothing that was near to where I was going to be, where I ended up. But that so, was why I came. So when when you take a look at the uh, <clears throat> the survival training within the um, uh, RAF, there, what what sort of scope did that look like? What what did you do with that? Well, it's a prerequisite. I was, a, I was, I held a position as a train, the, tra the training officer at Cranwell for aircrew training, airman aircrew training for a number of years at the Royal Air Force College at, mm. at RAF Cranwell. And in that job, we, we, uh, we're required, we train all the aircrew in survival. They have certain check boxes they have to do. The military, you're continually chasing, keeping qualified and doing things. That's the way it works. Whatever your skill sets are, you need to do. Right. But they have basic training, basic survival training, and then there's further advanced courses that you can do, whether it goes into desert survival or winter survival or jungle survival. And I did a combat survival rescue officers course. Some of your listeners will be aware of. So what, what would that entail? Uh, it was a couple of weeks at, uh, when I was, I did it at, Sorry, the latter. When I did the combat survival course, was right. in uh, was done at RAF St. Morgan, which is where the School of Combat Survival is now. Okay, um, it had moved there relatively recently, and I'd done previous training down on the south, down on the south coast, mm -hmm. of uh, other parts of the south coast. Um, and we did uh, we did quite a bit of classroom stuff, and then you do practical stuff, which you're actually taken out to Dartmoor, and what you what you're standing up in is what you've got, and maybe a, a little like a little tobacco tin. That was your, 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 your carry pack. That's what you got. And then right. you did that for a number of days of survival. And then it in inevitably ended, uh, towards the middle half of the second week, you ended up with a, a period of resistance to uh, R2I resistance to interrogation training. Okay. Uh, which is obviously not something that we, that was discussed widely and something I wouldn't want to talk about. No, I understand. To understand what, if you were at risk of capture, what, what could you expect and how could you best, best prepare yourself? Mm hmm. That's a huge, that's a huge psychological aspect to that as well. I, I think that, uh, having the, the mental fortitude to, uh, withstand that as well as the, uh, the headspace just to be in a survival mindset, I, I think is probably would, I shouldn't presuppose, would that, would that be the biggest outcome that you're trying to instill in people aside from just physical skills, but building that, that mindset of survival? Yeah. The mindset, it comes from deep within a person and it's very difficult to quantify, but there are, 
they they come up with all these statistics of who survives in a situation and who doesn't. And there are people that have exceeded expectations incredibly and it's just through the strength of their, their will and their mind to overcome it that they will come out of this. For whatever it is, it could be faith-based, it could be uh, family-based, it could be based on so many different things, but it's something and it's something that I explain to people. It overrides everything. It, it, you, you can learn all these skills, you can have lots of equipment, you can prepare lots of different things, but you have to think about the mental resilience to be able to cope with what, what life throws at you. And in a survival situation, you are dumped into it very quickly. No kidding. Yeah, that's, I, I think we were talking before about a, and I'm not, I don't recall if this was a study. I read it as a child and I used to read a lot of popular mechanics and a lot of the magazines, everything I had seemed to be from the forties, fifties, sixties. I didn't really have too much current literature, but, um, one of them was talking about the survival rate of, um, uh, soldiers. And I think the situation was that they were lost at sea and they found that they had some young soldiers, some young bucks out there that were healthy and fit and well fed and strong. And, and they had some, um, uh, older soldiers out there as well. And they figured, well, you know, the, the young ones are going to do well, the old ones will probably die off, but they found the inverse to be true. And they found that the younger ones were dying at a higher rate. And I think they just used the example of this one loss at sea thing. Um, and the older ones were persevering because these are people who've been through World War One, and this was a World War II study that they were doing. These are people who've been there and done that and have an idea of what hardship looks like and realize I, I can overcome this. In, in essence, I think it was their mental mindset that was allowing them to persevere where, um, those who didn't have that background were flailing. So like I said, I'm just going back on, on memory and recollecting that one. I don't know if it was a story or as an observation, a hypothesis or an actual study, but I remember reading it as if it was more of a study. Um, have, is that something that you have seen or found within the survival training? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> there's lots of records of people who have survived and they seem to be anomalies. How did this individual or these two people, how did they survive when they, they had the same circumstances put in front of them as others who died and, uh, uh not, and they succumbed to their, to the conditions or to the weather or whatever else. Right. And it's, it's such a tough thing to do. And really you don't know that you can do it until you've been put in that situation. And I mean, for real, I've never had to survive for real. I've had to do it as close as I want to come. And, uh, mm. that's part of the things they, they stress when you go through the training is that you'll, you'll probably come closer than you've ever been to dying in you know, over this period of time, but you're working in pairs at that time and, and to keep an eye on each other to, to, you know, if things get really bad, this is a training exercise, but, mm. um, interestingly, I did a, I did a winter survival course in Bavaria and it was minus 20 and, uh, did that. I was out there for a couple of weeks. And then just a couple of months later, I was doing my full combat survival course and I was on Dartmoor and it was only minus two. And I was overconfident because it wasn't as cold as it had been in Bavaria, mm. but Dartmoor is a challenging environment it is wet and uh, i went hypothermic there and uh yeah that was that was tough the, the brain starts shutting down you can't think clearly but the colleague i was with um it was a fast jet pilot and he he recognizes me i think i said something to him and realized i was deteriorating and he said we need to do something so we did and uh yeah fortunately it, it was all okay yeah i've i've never you know, I've, I've been in situations where I've had to push myself and in situations where if I didn't push myself through it, then death would have been the logical outcome. Um, but I, I can't say I've ever been in like a truly sort of survival situation. I, like I, I can recall, I think it was 16 years old and I had my wood panel station wagon. And I mean, that thing was, what was it? A 1978 Pontiac, like wood panel station wagon. And I, I used to pull it out onto uh, let's number 10 highway, which is you know, people familiar with the lower mainland would know what I'm talking about. And if I didn't let the thing warm up for, let's say 10 minutes, as I pulled out, the thing would just stall and I'd have to coast and try and get the thing going and hope the cars go around me and, you know, people you typically did. And, 
but it was not a reliable vehicle. And somehow I was able to convince a couple of friends of mine at the time to go up, uh, past Kamloops to an area where my family had a, uh, a cabin up there. And, uh, I, in my heart of hearts, didn't think that I figured the vehicle would probably make it up there, but I, I didn't think it would start up again and come back down. Right. And this is in the middle of winter is just after Christmas and, and, uh, Never used snowshoes before at that time, but a, a guy at the local, I think they call it mountain magic. He uh, stayed up late on Christmas Eve to, uh, so I could get off work and borrow some snowshoes. Anyways, totally underprepared, get up there in this wood panel station wagon, uh, leave sleeping bag and everything else inside the vehicle, just in case, you know, we needed it, it would be back there. We'd have it and we're at hindsight it would have done us more good if I had that with me because, and then we had to go, I think it was just about 21 K hike in, uh, most of it on a, um, old logging road that wasn't plowed and, um, and then some bushwhacking. And at that time, a, uh, a friend had provided, uh, satellite photos and this was like state of the art satellite photos. I'm like, ah, oh, this'll be great. Cause he, he got them from a logging company. I had no idea how to look at these sat photos. I'd used a map and compass in the past, but I'm, I'm trying to just dead reckon off the things. Anyways, what I, what I didn't realize was as we walk in on this old logging road, which wasn't plowed, the main road looks just like all the other side roads. <laughs> when it snowed on, cause they're just as wide and he can't see which one look it, it, long story short, we ended up getting lost and we spent a long time out there in the, uh, in the cold. And, uh, I remember, uh, at one point we've got all of our uh, heavy equipment. I got my knives and, uh, of course you got to have some alcohol in the back and all the necessities when you're 16 years old and going out. Right. And, um, the sun was out and it was minus, I think it was minus five or so, but when you're, you're going hard and the sun's out, I mean, I just had a t-shirt on for, uh, for a lot of it. And, uh, I remember at one point when, uh, I figured I'll, I'll take a shortcut. I think I know where this area is and it's, it's typically a, a fly in or hike in cabin anyways. And, uh, I started walking down this steep embankment and this whole bunch of deadfall and kept falling in it. And it was, uh, cold, of course, I'm covered in snow. And I remember when I came back up, uh, the sun was going down, but for me, it was getting really dark for some reason. It was like, it, it feels like it's getting darker than it should. And I didn't realize that I'd stopped shivering a long time ago on my body it was basically shutting down and, and, uh, felt like I was going to pass out. And I, I told the two people who I was with, I said, look at, if I pass out and I'm don't come back up, the keys are in the top of my pack. I'm pretty sure. And I point over, if we just go that way down this embankment and go through, you're going to hit a lake and then we can find the cabin and we'll get over there. Well, I started, I, of course I bundled up and wrapped up and got a, a few layers on me, uh, and just kept myself moving a little bit extra warmth, totally changes the mindset. Um, muscles are all very fatigued at that point. Everything's seizing up in the, uh, hip flexors. I got to a point where I felt, okay, I'm good. I'm not going to pass out my two friends. I'm like, okay, scale of one to 10. How do you feel? And, uh, I said 10 top of the world and one year on the brink of death. Right. <laughs> I said, right now, I think I'm a six. I've, I've, I've got my energy. I think I'm good. I got some fluids and, and food into me. I'm starting to warm up a bit. One friend says, oh, four. The other one says one. I'm like, oh, great. Anyways, we end up getting in, took us about half an hour to walk this one distance when we finally found the lake, which should have taken us, oh, no, it actually took us 45 minutes. It took us 45 minutes to walk this distance, which should have taken us, I don't know, 10 max. And, uh, I remember my hands weren't working and I'm trying to get the, uh, uh, the door open and the keys weren't working. Like everything was just like ice you got this idea, you get in the cabin, everything's going to be okay, but it's the same temperature as it is outside. We're able to get a fire going, thankfully. And in no time at all, you know, warming up and the world is good, but it went from a situation which could have been pretty bad. Mm -hmm. All of our uh, survival gear really to keep us warm was left in the vehicle and it was a good life experience, but it also, it, it tends to build a, uh, I guess a mental mindset of what you actually can endure. And, um, uh, one friend got, uh, we we're all somewhat hypothermic and one friend got frostbite and, 
Um, but it, it, it also gives you some checks and balances from that ego that says, I'll be fine. I got this black and white photocopy of a satellite photo and it's only 21 K. Um, and, and that's something that I keep in the back of my head when I, when I plan different, um, outings or when I think about, uh, different situations is, is the whole, what if, what do I have with me that I could use, but as well, uh, the thought process in planning anything now, whether it's just going out on an expedition or just going out in the wild or even just going to the store, I will tend to go through a mental process of, um, of planning. Is that something that you find you do or that you find, uh, that you would train others to do? I think it's something I do. I think, I think it's something that's drilled into you, particularly in the military, you mm -hmm. know, um, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. Um, okay. but it's always, if this occurs, actions on, if this occurs, what am I going to do? So if you've thought about it beforehand, you can have the right equipment with you. You've already thought through what your options would be. If I'm at this stage of a, talking about a trek or something or a hike across over a considerable distance, if this happens, where's my, where's my get out? How am I going to get out? You know, where's the the best place for me to be? What, many, it always happens at the worst place. Where's the worst place <laughs> on this journey where it could happen? Oh man, I'm mid midway between two points. That way I've got to go through a river and this way I'm going back up a, up a huge mountain. Or right. Something. And it's, <clears throat> what are my options going to be and who have I got with us? And you've always then got to reassess what equipment you've got and what resources you've got as far as people with you. You shouldn't be on your own, but. You mm -hmm. have a team, some might be more, always somebody's going to be more capable than others. Right. So it's always, it's always trying to prepare for the worst and just, and if you don't use it, it's not, it's not an issue. Mm. You know, one thing that I see, so uh, Ian Jones, he's with the Canadian Prepper podcast. He's been on the Silver Core podcast in the past and he had a whole bunch of great thoughts and ideas and he shared a lot of, a lot of really good information. So if the listeners are interested in listening to that episode, they can go back and check it out. I don't off the top of my head recall the episode number, but you know, Silver Core Podcast, Ian Jones, Canadian Prepper Podcast. And you know, some of the things that we spoke about was like different types of kit and gear. And I think most people, when they first get into, um, and we also talked about mindset, but most people, when we they first get into the idea of being prepared or survival. I think they're looking for shortcuts or they, something that they can purchase that will give them comfort. Well, now I've got my Gerber multipliers. I'm prepared for anything, right? Or, or whatever it might be. But I, I find that a lot in, in people that I speak with. They say, well, I've got my emergency blanket or I've got A, B, C, D and and I've been guilty of that in the past too, thinking, okay, I need all these different things only to find that the amount of kit that you end up taking with you starts slowing you down to a point where you're now in a survival situation based on the fact that you couldn't go fast and go light and go hard. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. <clears throat> I think an analogy I would use, it's a bit like, it's like cooking, you know, there's lots of people can cook but there's only a few people that are good enough to be Michelin chefs. You know, they can produce the most excellent meals to incredibly high standards consistently. And I think somebody who's never cooked before says, well, that's what I would like to do. Well, I can give you the best kitchen with the best knives and all the best equipment and all the best fruits and vegetables. Mm. And now I'll put you against a Michelin chef and I'll give you some crappy old equipment. Right. Who's going to turn the best meal out? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, so there's not a shortcut to it, but there's lots of things you can do. It doesn't hurt to have good equipment. Don't get me wrong. Mm. And you'll find, I think everybody who's ever been in survival situations and training and, uh, particularly military people, they know that it's good to have equipment that you can rely on and they've invariably owned their own equipment. There's right. issue stuff, but you choose not to wear the boots you issued. You choose not to carry that knife. You choose not to use that compass, you use something that you really have got a, um, an affinity with that it does what you need it to do. Right. So it's not just equipment. It's, it's a combination of things. That's what I like to focus on and giving people the confidence to know that you can learn things, you can learn and you can experience things and improve your chances. Yeah. I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised at people who I know people who are afraid to go into the water just out here in the lower mainland because of what may lurk below, right? Sharks or, 
uh, seeing enemies or, or whatever, right? And there's this uh, fear of the unknown or they're afraid to go into the bush because the, in their head, there's bears everywhere, right? And the bears are going to, but the, the knowledge, I guess, of actually starting to push yourself out into these different situations will cause you to learn and cause you to realize what the real threats are and what they aren't. Like you're, you're the threat of you slipping and falling on, let's say the grouse grind is far greater than ever encountering a bear or a cougar, right? Um, um, the threat of getting lost and perhaps you need to spend a night over someplace and knowing how to keep yourself warm through the night and, uh, ha having that level of knowledge, I think breeds a, uh, a lot of comfort and security and confidence. The confidence is the word I was going to use. You right. give somebody the confidence, you push them to what they think are their limits. And that's the way very much of the training that that's done by the military. They, they push you then beyond your limits. You get to a point where you think I can't do anymore. I can't go any further. I've been, a, you know, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope, but mm. the reality is we've all got extra stuff in there, but they push you beyond that. <laughs> suddenly you find you're doing more. And then when you, reflect on it afterwards you have huge confidence you change personalities change within through 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 training significantly families don't recognize their own their own family member at the end of two three four six months they say well, how did you do this they're completely changed right so if somebody's i guess let's say just start out a urban city dweller uh, and they want to be a little bit more prepared. And I, th I think there's a, a folly that a lot of people will fall into when they're looking at being prepared, they want to be prepared for everything. And they want to, what if there's the earthquake or the tsunami or, or a big power outage or, and they, and they make this huge all encompassing, um, preparedness plan. And then they get this idea. I know I'm going to have a whole bunch of food and, uh, st start stockpiling it. So I'm good. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to have all these different tools and equipment. And, um, uh, I, one of the ones that was, uh, was interesting that, uh, that you had brought up in our past conversation was, oh, I'm, I'm going to use some bleach to sanitize water because I might not have, have a, uh, a sanitary supply. And what I didn't realize was that you said bleach has a shelf life. Six months, I think. Six to six to twelve months. Yeah, the effect, the uh, efficacy of it drops significantly after a year. But uh, yeah, so you need to have a long term supply of bleach. Not think, oh, I've got twenty bottles of it stored away in the in the garage or somewhere. That's going to be that's me good for the next ten years. Right, it doesn't work like that. Right. Well, where where would you start if if you were uh, looking to be a bit more prepared? Okay, so uh, I think. What I was going to say to you, we, you don't know what's coming, but I think we I think we could all agree we're living in a pretty weird world at the moment. If you told everybody two years ago we'd be going through what we're going through now, you would have said, no, that won't happen. There are things going on now I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. I know. You told me one thing that was right before we went on air that kind of surprised me, but. Yeah. Um, but I think if you have concerns about things like natural disasters or uh, the inst the stability or instability potentially of society where things uh, the, the people are being divided. Uh, we've got financial issues. People have got job security issues, inflation, supply issues. All of these things are potentially problems for the future. So what mm. I said, uh, I think I mentioned to you before, if you've got no concerns about any of this and you think, oh, everything's, the sun's going to come up tomorrow and everything's going to be good, then mm. this is probably not a podcast for you. Right. But if you're the person who's got Band-Aids at home or some sort of headache medication, whether it's an Advil or a, something like that, Tylenol, if you've got that, why have you got it? You've got it because you're thinking ahead. You're thinking, what if this occurs? Right. Particularly with a Band-Aid, you know, you, nobody prepares to cut themselves, but if you do, you know that you need something. So I think it's... Um, the whole scenario of people talk, call it different things, call it what you want to call it, whether you're going to call it preparing or prepping or being off grid or homesteading, whatever it is, give it your own title, but just know that's what you're looking at. And then give yourself as much, as much chance as you can, as give you cover as many bases as you can. This is a huge subject and there are some great experts out there, uh, in, in particular, in particular areas that are so, so good at this and 
lean on those people. I mean, people are used to using the internet now. There is some bad advice out there as well, but you just mm -hmm. go with the ones that you trust. Um, but I think just to have a, an, an overview of what are the big hitting things, what what, what do you need to think about? That, yeah. that's, that's what I would focus on. Um, I would always say the best time to start is right now. Wherever you are on this, start now. Just start thinking about it and give a little bit of mental energy towards what could happen, but what do I need to do to prepare myself and to give myself the best chance of survival? Everyone, but everyone has got a different starting point, and I'm sure all the, the people will be aware that this is, this varies according to a number of things, it, and I'll just give you just some of them. Mm -hmm. First one, your age. How old are you? A lot tend to be a lot more capable physically at 25 to 35 than you are 65 to 75. You're just mm. not as good and fit. Everybody has different experiences in life and hobbies and knowledge, the things that they've acquired over the years. Um, also, the number of people you've got to think about. Are you just thinking about yourself or are you thinking about have you got a partner, have you got children, have you got a, se a senior citizen or two or neighbours? or mm. Who are you going to try and are you just going to ignore them and say, no, I'm just, this is all about me? Mm. I don't think that's the best thing. There are also... People have medical medical limitations. Medical limitations is a significant one. Uh, so, some people have some things where they need to maintain medications in a, in a, in a cool, cool uh, situation mm -hmm. with refrigerations and things like that. Um, there's a big difference between your 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 physical location. Are you there's benefits, but there's also limitations. Do you live in a, a desert or semi-arid or tropical location, or mm -hmm. where are you located in the world? So. Be aware of your surroundings and what are the strengths of being there, but also what are the challenges? And there are strengths and challenges in both. Right. So I think once you look at all of those, I then say to people, make a start, create your own personal review of what you know. You obviously don't know what you don't know. <laughs> but, yes. but but if there's areas you think, if we mention something, you think, oh, I should look at that. This is something I should look at. But then try and keep some sort of priority order. In a combat survival situation, they teach protection, location, water, and food in that order. Mm. And those are big encompassing things. The location is, I would argue, less of an issue. That's the location where you're trying to be rescued when you want somebody to find you. But certainly the protection, water, and food in that order is important. Mm. So I would ask people to think about those. Your protection covers a thousand and one things. I could just give you some, but... Uh, just give you some right now your shelter where are you actually going to be protected from the elements right and that varies according to where you are in the world the clothing you have dressing appropriately and being able to dress up and dress down and understand the importance of layers and how when you're exercising you're you're sweating more and um whether you need to keep as i say keep yourself warm because you're in a more challenging uh, environment as far as the cold weather and the winter months are concerned or also mm -hmm. cooling if you're in a place like a desert where you uh, where it's exceptional heat you've got to get out of the sun during the midday you do not want to be in the sun no uh, things like this is also still under the protection umbrella first aid first aid is really important because you can't just pick up the phone and dial 911 depending where you are you know this from you're in the back country you've got to do stuff to get somebody to aid hopefully you're not you know it's not you're not devoid of all support, but mm. you can't guarantee the cavalry are coming over the hill to help you. So that's important. I would also argue, um, and this is particularly good for silver, called armament and protection, protecting you from what, if you're in an environment where you've got animals that are trying to get in and see what food you've got, you're going to have to protect yourself on what you've got. Right. Um, finances. Um, I, if you're in the situation, people think, well, if there's... If, if there's a big collapse of things and the, there's no power and there's no fuel or anything, well, I'll just go down to the bank and draw some money out <laughs> and go to the supermarket. Yeah, that's, that's that's a nice idea, but that's not the reality of it. So think about how you protect yourself with finances. Do you have some cash on hand, as long as cash is still useful, but are you then handing somebody a you know, a $20 bill and he says, that's useless to me because I can't spend it? You know, right. Do you have another option? Do you have something... One of the things people focus on things like precious metals, um, mm. uh, and then it comes down to understanding w which are the better ones to have and how you store it, where you keep it. But is that something you, you could use in the future to to purchase or to barter? Um, mm. And there's lots of bartering that will go on in the survival situations if it hits more of us, so that um, 
people can swap skills and equipment and things between mm. them and say, well, I'll let you have this if you can let me have that. Mm -hmm. And I can see that will become a will become a, a big, big, big thing. Well, for for that one, like I've I've always been a firm believer. Got to have some cash on hand, right? Some cash somewhere. But we're becoming more and more of a cashless society, and the value of having cash on hand like you're saying, just, just might not be there. And I've got a friend recently, he says, Trav, can you come downtown? I, I want someone with me to, uh, uh, to help me out. I've got, uh, should I say, uh, I'm not saying who the friend is. I got a dollars in gold that I'm picking up and I'd like, cause he's, he's concerned about his, um, I, 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 perhaps what's happening with cash and what's happening with the, uh, uh the banking system and. He says, they're just going to give it to me in gold and I got to then transport it to a place, a location where it's going to be safely kept. Um, but again, I have to wonder if that concept of having, uh, precious metals will hold much value to an individual in a, uh, in a society that is moving ever, ever more, I guess, cashless and sort of decentralizing the, um, uh, the banking. I don't know. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah. I think you have to look at history. <clears throat> try and learn from history and history is somewhat flawed. It's just the, the recollection or the, the narrative of the, the winners in a scenario. That's what right. they let, that's let what they let us know. Um, but I think, um, I have a good friend whose family escaped from, uh, Eastern Europe between the wars that they're following the, the October revolution in Russia. And they mm. basically had all their lands confiscated, but they managed to get to Canada. They my family managed to get there when they got to, and they were trying to get out of Europe, but they managed to pay for their passage across the Atlantic. Mm. And the biggest single thing that got them out was actually the children had had gold coins sewn into the lapels of their coats. They didn't check the children because they didn't think they would have them. They, the, the parents were strip searched. They checked everything, went through all their paperwork, documentation, all their luggage, but they didn't check the children. But these children had little gold coins sewed all the way down through the lapels. And when they got to Canada, they said, could we get this? Uh, what have you got? We've got gold. Oh, wow. Yeah, that'll do nicely. You know, and they, ah. they got farmland straight away. They got equipment. Um, one thing I would say, talking about your friend with the, uh, you know, with the <laughs> dollars of yeah, gold, yeah, yeah. A, a big single, or maybe not a single barb, a gold ingot mm -hmm. that's worth, you know, a few hundred thousand, eighty thousand dollars or whatever it's worth yeah. is less tradable. So having some big stuff is useful, but having something that's actually usable, mm -hmm. smaller quantities that will be swappable because mm -hmm. people uh, and have paperwork printed off to show what it was worth before stuff occurred, you know. That's a good point. Uh, so you, just to say, this is what it was, this is what I purchased it for, and... Uh, one of the things that's good here in Canada, they do these um, one, one gram coins in a pack. Right. And you can, if you, if you just want one, you can break one off. If you want to give them, if you're trading for the whole thing, you could do that. Yeah. Um, and it's all, it's all relative. I mean, you're obviously paying a lot more for that gold, but it's very tradable. It's mm. very, very swappable and barterable with other people. That is a good point. Yeah. So give yourself as many, many options as possible. This is all comes under this protection umbrella. So okay. you're thinking about... What do I do? What's going to happen in six months, 12 months? And who knows what the time scale will be, but how do I do something about this? Right. Yeah. And then of course, if you're known, I should suppose as the person who's prepared and who can take care of themselves and who has some stockpiles, you'll likely become a target at that point too, by anybody who happens to know this. So yeah. it would, would be something that I think would be wise for people just to, to not advertise and maybe not get on all the different forums and, and tell everybody what they know and what they have, because, uh, you know, time and time again, we hear, um, I hear people saying, oh, Trav, if something goes wrong, I'm going to come to your house. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right. You get a lot of friends very quickly, <laughs> but right. you can't, you can't help everybody. You can't support the whole of the Western world or the whole of the world and <laughs> around at Travis's house. That's right. And then I hear the other side, what do I need to prep for? I know where the preppers are. I'm just going to go to their house and take it from them. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Nick before. Nick says that and he says, you know, the, <laughs> if, you, if, if you're storing and you don't have any way to protect that, you're just storing it for other people. That's right. Yeah. Good way. Good old Nick. Um, and this is not about setting up. You're not trying to set up a, uh, an armory or something, but it's just being able to know that you've got stuff located that you know where it is and other mm. people wouldn't know where it is and how, how you prepare stuff. So 
It's just being smart, in my opinion. I agree. Um, so that's what I call the protection. There's there's other things that you and I and other people can think of that would fall under that protection. But I think that, that protects you, that gives you the best chance. Shelter and accommodation is very important because unless you unless you're going to just be sleeping outdoors, which you might get away with in some parts of the world at some dark parts of the year, mm -hmm. but you're not going to be doing that long term. So you need to have a, a place. Mm -hmm. Think about whether you are urban or rural. Rural tends to be better for survival longer term because there's less people, less. Dare I say, if there is a societal breakdown, there's less roaming gangs going around. So right. you probably stand a better chance and you want to be as low key as possible. Mm -hmm. Another thing that falls under protection is things like can you provide enough power for yourself? Do you, do you, do you thought that you want to have generators or inverters or some other means of generating power? That's all comes under the protection, mm. under the protection umbrella. Right. Yeah. Having a, um, a multi-fuel generator, probably a pretty good idea. Having a way to, uh, I guess just collect power from let's say solar energy or wind energy. Again, not a bad idea, but you'd have to store that in, a, in battery banks. Or yep. find, maybe, maybe some a large capacitor bank that could have a slow discharge. I'm not sure. I'm just kind of thinking yeah, people, about it. People thinking about, um, I know this is a, this is a scenario I've been through is what, what, what do I need power for? You know, do I, do I need to be on the internet and checking my emails and, and doing social media? No. What do I need? I'd like the fridge and freezers to still be working. I'd mm. like the furnace to be working. So you can tailor what your power requirements are. Mm. Do I need to be? Doing, uh, you know, doing that use running the dishwasher or the clothes washer, you know, twice a day. No, you, you, you've got enough clothes. You could probably last a few months with the clothes that you've got. Right. You might end up doing a lot of washing at the end of it, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> but using other methods of doing things like cleaning, and this is these are more the niceties, the long term. This is not a short term survival things, but can do you have the ability to wash things? Mm. Have the ability to do. Our grandparents, or dare I say our great-grandparents, would have just thought this was quite normal because they had all the automation of stuff with right. electrical stuff. They'd have said, well, that's the way we used to do it. Well, <laughs> we might end up, you could foreseeably end up back doing it the way they used to do it. Yeah, I don't know if I'm targeted or what, if this, uh, if the algorithm has uh, taken a look at my interests. I, I don't generally seek out survival and prep type stuff, uh, but I keep seeing ads scrolling through on TikTok about try to sell some book about how things were done back in the day, how to make your own lard, how to uh, make your own soap and all, all of these, yeah. uh, basic things that were pretty basic back in the day. Uh, I think it was called forgotten skills. Here I am advertising for something I find see on, on uh, TikTok, but I, I see that there is a desire in the general public, at least as much to, uh, necessitate or facilitate these, these advertisements or the sale of these different books or, or platforms so people can learn about these quote unquote forgotten skills. Mm. I, I see that coming back in a big way. And I think COVID has really kind of woken everybody up in a couple of senses, both in the sense that something could happen, whether COVID's just a big cold or not, or whatever people want to look at, but the idea that something could possibly happen and society might not be as stable as people think that they might, there might be some, uh, instabilities that would require people to be a little bit more prepared. So I, I think the general populace has really been turning its head towards how can I garden and create my own food? How can I, how can I make sure that I've, you know, if the power does go out that will be warm long enough. And yeah. uh, a bunch of these little things, I, I think it's created some instability. There's always been instability, but it's brought it to the forefront in people's minds. Yeah. I think people are, are starting to look at it. The smart people have definitely been looking at it for a longer time, but uh, mm. other people are just saying, as I said to you before, two years ago, we didn't predict we would be where we are now. Right. And would have said, no, that'll never happen. Well, things do happen. We've got some unprecedented uh, stuff just happening in the last 24 hours here in Canada. You know, we're going into with the Emergencies Act, which is uh, fairly serious. It's substantial. It is substantial, and people don't understand just how substantial it is, and I think can dismiss it and say, oh, well, that's what we're doing. Mm. This, is a, this is a significant impact, and uh, it will have impact on many people. Oh yeah. Uh, and it can, that will have an impact down the road. This is uh, the butterfly effect. It's going to impact lots of other, 
lots of other things, those things I mentioned before, as far as inflation and supply issues. And right. It's not just a matter of going to the store and picking it up. That, that's, that's The fact we can still do it at the moment is nice, but don't expect it necessarily to... I don't want to be a prophet of doom, but don't expect it to always be exactly like that. It's happened It's happened in uh, longer history, but it's also happened in recent history in Europe. And we've got people even here in Canada who've come, escaped from regimes where they've said they didn't expect this to be happening. And it has happened. You know, I've, I've had that same conversation with a lot of different people who have, like you say, escaped different regimes. Um, and there's... They'll just call a spade a spade and they'll say, look at, I've seen this happen before. I've lived through this before. What's happening isn't right. And those who haven't been through it and don't have that experience, they, they just aren't as, uh, open to considering the possibility of the fact that things are going sideways or they could be really bad or there could be negative intention behind it, or there could be good intentions behind it. But we all know what the road to hell is paved with, right? Um, I, I don't necessarily think that everybody is out there. Um, I, I don't think there's some diabolical Machiavellian uh, plot here that's been driving what's been happening in our social events. I do think absolutely that there are some who will take abs full advantage of what's going on. Uh, and I think that the, um, let's say otherwise good intentions of many, I have some friends who work in government and they are salt of the earth type people, their hearts is in the right place. And from my perspective, uh, and some of them anyways, are very blind to what's going on, even if they have background, a background in history or philosophy or, or what have you. And they, sh and they should have an understanding of the fact that history repeats itself and the best predictor of future performance is past performance. So human, human behavior is, is, is fascinating and it is very, we're a lot more predictable as a species than we would sometimes like to think. We think, oh, we're a lot smarter than we used to be. We'll make the right <laughs> decisions. The reality is people are going to do what they're going to do. And if people get scared, that's a big driver. Fear is the massive driver of the population and has been used forever to manage people and you can get people moving in a certain direction you put a certain chain of events in place and it's then becomes a lot easier for the next thing the next thing in that chain to happen yes yeah so, yeah i look at like noam chomsky's book on manufacturing consent right yeah. and, and and using the the media there i when you say people are predictable that for me has been the most interesting aspect of what we've been going through is watching the human response, watching how people respond to the external events that are happening in a very group think type of way, because inherently I think people are so afraid of being outcast or not fitting in with the rest of the group that otherwise intelligent people who can formulate their own opinions on their own and come to logical conclusions will just go in line with whatever the popular consensus is currently going out of fear. I mean, it wasn't too long ago when everyone was talking about COVID and hush breaths, if at all, for fear of being called a conspiracy theorist, right? Yeah. And when you, when you look at if as a hunter, you look at game trails, you know that there's probably going to be game that goes down this trail because these animals will take the path of least resistance. Some might bound over in er areas that are off the path, but for the most part, a good indicator is this path. And people are just like that. People take the path of least resistance. They want other people to make decisions for them, to protect them, to, uh, to blindly assume that everything is going to be just fine because the consequence of thinking otherwise would be that you have to prepare and you have to, uh, work and take responsibility for your actions. I think, uh, just as you were talking there, it just reminded me, I'm sure some of you some of the, the, the listeners will know the experiments they've done where the people getting into an elevator and as you get into the elevator, right. everybody's facing the back of the elevator, not yeah. facing the door yeah. and they walk in and they feel uncomfortable. It's, in, it's hilarious to watch and they, they talk to them after, why did you turn around and face the way as everybody else? Yeah. I don't know. I just, just wanted to fit in. I just thought yeah. it was the right way. Did you see the beep one the, in the uh, doctor's office? With the electric shock? No, th this was, um. I thought, so it was, it was a variation on the elevator one where they get everyone to turn around, but, uh, they took it one step further. 
So they have a room full of actors in a doctor's office and a patient comes on in and uh, a beep goes off and everybody in the room stands up when the beep goes and they hear another beep and they all sit down and this patient's like looking around, like what, what the heck's going on here? Right. And then another beep goes, everyone stands up and they sit down, they keep doing this. All of a sudden that she's standing up and sitting down and little by little, uh, new patients come in. These are people that are not the actors and they're uh, not a part of the program. And they keep doing this until they reach a point where there are no more actors and it's just new people in there and the beep's going and they're standing up and sitting down on the beep just because that's how it's done. Scary. It's a scary thought, isn't it? Oh, very. It reminds me, <clears throat> I was listening to a, a thing recently, you know, um, Dr. Julie Paness, the, uh, the, uh, professor, uh, from Ontario. And she was talking about one of them. She does t teaches ethics and she said, shows the picture from 1930s Germany. We've got that. It's a famous black and white picture. Where the whole crowd is doing the Nazi salute. Right. But there's one guy who isn't. Right. And she used to ask her students and say, would you be one of the crowd or would you be him? And everybody likes to think they would be the him. But the reality is people go to the line of least resistance. Well, that's what we do. We fit in. Right. People Just are. accept. You know, and when you're talking about people being in it for themselves earlier, right? When you're uh, like, are you going to just be in it for yourself? Or are you going to look out after others? I, I was, had a, a friend, a couple of friends over, um, a few weeks ago. And, uh, I mentioned that to her and I said, look at inherently everybody, everybody is in it for themselves. And she says, she says, I don't believe that. I said, okay. Let's say there's a fire in here right now. And I didn't even have to finish the sentence. She says, oh, I'm grabbing Adelaide, her daughter, <laughs> right? Right. At some point, everybody is in it for themselves. Where is that line though? Some people that line's pretty far down. Some people, their day-to-day -day life, they operate right on that, on that line between, oh, you know, there's something going on. It could be you, it could be me. I tell you what, I'm, screw you. It's me, right? Um, but I, I, I firmly believe that, uh, everybody is in it for themselves just based on the human condition, based on the fact that we are creatures and we want to survive. Um, some people get a little greedy or a little, a little power hungry or whatever it might be. And you'll find, uh, you'll find that line pretty close, but I, I guess, um, before I digress too far here. Uh, your next category that you're talking about was. Uh, water. 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 Okay. Um, it's for people to think just how important water is. A lot of people, particularly when they start off in preparing for you know, whatever's going to happen, they think that just means I just got to fill the pantry full of food. And that's not, that's not right. the way, way ahead. Food falls further down the, uh, further down the priority list. Um know how much water you need and you're going to research this I won't go into numbers now because mm. it's a separate thing but talking that you know the, the volume of it that you will need per person mm. there's ways you can reduce the volume they're using I mean if you're the sort of person's having four showers a day that's or four <laughs> baths a day that's probably not going to be good uh it's not going to be happening but you need the volume that you need and the cleanliness and safety of it because you've got to drink water. You have to have fluids and you mm. have to do it. And you can't, I'm sorry to tell some people, you can't survive exclusively on alcohol or Coca-Cola. That's not going to work. I know some people. <laughs> I know some, people <laughs> some people give it a go. I know. Yes. I'm not saying alcohol and they don't have a role to play because they, they are useful to have. Mm. They're very, very tradable items, interestingly, for, for bartering. Point. Alcohol's excellent for trading because you offer somebody who hasn't seen any alcohol for a couple of months and you say, I would really like to get some fuel for my generator. What have you got? Oh, I've got this little half bottle of vodka. No problem. <laughs> Suddenly <laughs> Good happens. Point. Good point. So it can be very useful. But it's understanding how, how you know, what options have you got? Again, it goes back to where do you live in the world? Do you have a lot? You know, if, ideally, I guess you'd be living on a uh, off grid. You'd have your own well or you'd have your own river and right. you've got your own cleansing system and you're used to doing this, you've been doing this for years. That's, that's, that's the, the, the sort of the gold standard. But again, you're not just nipping up to the suit, the store and buying a case of water. Right. If that's not happening or potentially not just turning the tap on and getting good, 
clean drinkable water out. If that's it's not happening, what are you doing? So you need a way to have a certain amount of water stored and then to be able to cleanse that to make it mm. drinkable. It doesn't have to all be cleansed to the same standard as drinking because you could wash in it, you could be washing clothes. Right. But the stuff that you're going to be drinking, you want to keep yourself hydrated. You know from the back country. Totally. Dehydration is one of the biggest killers. Oh yeah. It gets you big time and it affects your physical performance, your mental performance, your, yeah, no, you, you need to stay hydrated. Yeah. People, and people think if they haven't really looked at this. They think, oh, well, if it's hot day, I'll be sweating and I'll lose it, but it's a cold day. So I won't. Well, you're then colder. You're wrapped up. You're sweating inside. Right. You're still losing to, even in winter survival, you lose, you're sweating and dehydrating. And, and I got to wonder, so if you, if you look at a uh, hydrometer and, uh, inside a, a house during the summertime, it's going to be much more humid. And in the winter time, of course, it's going to be much more arid. Um, I, I've always kind of wondered about how much, uh, how much the body kind of absorbs for moisture in the more humid environments that will, uh, make the need for perhaps water less and how much in colder environments, just the act of breathing out is expelling possibly more in such a dry environment, expelling more water. Yeah. I think two, two totally different climatic situations, sea survival, one of the big killers there is dehydration. People mm. think, well, I'm floating around in the ocean. Now, surely I'm not going to be dehydrated, but <laughs> you're not drinking the salt water. I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. But also jungle survival. You're in the tropics and it's crazy wet. It's raining all the time and sweating, but people become dehydrated there as well because the right. stuff that's falling is maybe it's not drinkable or it's going to give you, make you very sick, give you dysentery, which is not good. So you've got to need a, a means to cleanse that water. Right. Yeah. What did Homer Simpson say? Water, water everywhere. So let's all have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, wasn't, he wasn't far wrong. Um, so I move on to my next point. Let's. Okay. The next one, so going back down that hierarchy of protection water, the next one is food. So think about, um, I would say to people, make a start on this. So having a store of food, start off a general rule of thumb, and there's people who know way more about this than I do, but I would say sort of a, a three-day supply. Can you survive with three days without going out to the store? Most people say, oh, yeah, I could. But at the end of three days, if you're starving and not functioning properly, <laughs> it's not good. But some people just have just what they want, or they they rely totally on you know, bringing food in takeouts all mm. the time, which is not good. So do a three-day, then maybe a three-week, then a three-month, and then maybe up to a year. So if you can provide... You've got enough stored away to survive for a year. That's a, that's a useful, that's a huge buffer for you to see what happens with society. And I'm sure you're going to end up, and you're going to end up with a lot of friends as well. If you've got food mm. and you've got people near you, don't. But you've got to be cautious of that as well. But so you want to have stuff that's going to be tasty. It's got to be nutritious. You want some variety in there, but also some fresh stuff. What can you grow? Even in the winter in, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere as well in Canada, you can still grow things that, uh, with sprouting seeds and things like that can provide you a huge amounts of vitamin C and right. nutrients, which, which can be done. It's not that you don't have to wait until April, May before the crops are in the, in the fields. Just learn how you can extend the growing season. Right. And, uh, I'm going to come on to my next thing, which is talking about skills, but that's, that's one of those areas that skills are very important. Well, with the food one, you know, even just spending a week out in the back country on boil in a bag type food, it's amazing how, uh, unpalatable the same flavorless type of food, or even if it was a good food, but you're eating the same thing over and over again, despite being hungry, you kind of have to choke it down because you know, you need to replenish the calories that, you, that you're expending. Um, so when you say it's gotta be tasty, having that variation, and it's also amazing how much you crave fresh food or something that's some, some roughage, some, yeah. um, vegetables and you know, food is one of those things. I think a lot of people look at it and they say, oh yeah, I got to have lots of food. It's amazing how long you can actually live and still somewhat comfortably without food. I can't say the same without water. I can say, uh, the first day without food is very, um, it's not fun. Mind you, you go to sleep and you wake up and for whatever reason, I'm not hungry the next day and your body, I guess, shifts into a different mode. And then maybe I'll get a little bit hungry, but I, I find I really don't need a hell of a lot of food. Three days without food and I'm actually feeling okay. I, I've been in situations where unfortunately I've had to go a few days without food. Um, and 
I, I think food is obviously important, but when you're talking about water, I think all of my attention would be on protection and water with food as being, okay, I got an idea where I can possibly get something. Yeah. There's, and there's a whole lot to learn about what stores well and what doesn't store well. Mm. How are you going to do it? I mean, you're not just going to have a freezer that you're just going to pack with stuff and that's going to be good. The power's out if you've got no alternate power. Right. You're going to lose the whole lot. That's not good. But there's good, it's understanding the different types of, and I'll come into that in the skill section, the different types of how to, you know, food preservation and things like that. But having stuff that can be in tins, it can be dried products. All you've got to then do is rehydrate it. Well, right. if you've already addressed the water situation, you've now got the water to rehydrate it. Mm. And some of these things last long time i'm talking decades if you've stored correctly right and uh once you start to learn about that you can say hey well i can put this away and i know it'll be good for it'll be good in two years if i need to eat it in two two to three years and you could have some rotation but i always view it that the worst that can come with all of this is you end up with a store of food that you're going to use over a period of time and if you can cook it nutritiously you might have spent a bit of money to do it but it's a huge it's a huge an investment in your future. If things don't go well, absolutely, you, you, you can't just nip out and purchase it. So have some way to cover your backside. Totally. <clears throat> so then you got skills. Okay. Skills. Yeah. So skills, this is something that needs to be a, a continual improvement. You and I discussed this. So I'm just going to give a number of headings for th- people to think about. Can you do this or can't you do it? Mm. Um, I'll start with an easy one. Navigation. Um, it's all good. Well, I'll just use my phone. That's great as long as the phone's working, <laughs> GPS is working, and everything else. But if you have to go from point A to point B and maybe more, do you know how to navigate? Do you know how to read a map? Do you understand what the contour lines are doing and the terrain and choosing different routes? Which is the best way to go? So that's mm-hmm. one. Another one I would say fire lighting. Uh, that's something I love. I have, a, totally. I have a fire at home so I can have a log fire every night if yep. I want to. But how to light a fire if it's wet and rainy and what? equipment have you got to do it yeah. how do you how do you create spark and how do you build that fire how do you get where do you get kindling and yeah. tinder and that? how do you build a fire there's a famous thing that I used to teach us at combat survival is the say the uh, the the first native keeps happy sitting by the small fire keeps himself warm sitting by the small fire whereas the non-First Nations person keeps himself warm, running around collecting wood to keep this <laughs> huge fire going. Totally. Yeah, yeah, and sweating like crazy. Whereas you don't need a huge fire. But, no. But we, we talked before, you mentioned before, having a fire can be the difference between life and death. It's down under the skills. So it's not under the top three, but it's important. It gives you warmth. Yeah. It gives you comfort. It's, yeah. it's really, really grounding effect of it. Sitting around a fire, anybody's ever done it with with uh, you know with uh, s'mores or something they know how good it makes you feel sitting by a fire it's just some primal instinctual thing but even if you don't need it for warmth yep. all of a sudden everything just isn't as bad when you get a fire going all of yep. a sudden those noises that you hear in the dark they're a little further away. Yeah, it and keeps things away. It keeps nasty. You get the fire as well. It keeps it away. You can also use it for drying things as well if you've got clothing yeah. that you need to dry. But it, it's yeah. a psychological thing too. Huge. I know growing up, I, like a lot of people, love making fires. I love being around <laughs> fires, right? And um, talk to any firefighter. Right? There's going to be someone who likes making fires. Uh, but I would challenge myself. I Can I make a fire out of and just you know, some nice dry lumber, really dry stuff. Okay. I can, can I do it with, um, uh, this wetter wood? Okay. I can, can I do it with, uh, a lighter? Can I do it with just one match? Can I do it without matches? Can I, and I'd, I'd play these games. Can I do it with a chemical ignition? Can I do it with an electrical ignition? Can I, and just try all these different ways of just trying to make a fire, whether it's a friction drill or a plow or, or what have you love it. And I think fire making as a skill, I, I think that's not only just from cooking your food or from boiling your water or from, uh, distilling or, um, drying things out, keeping you warm. But I think that psychological effect of having a task at hand that you're working on and then the reward of sitting around that flickering light of the fire and the warmth is massive. I think. It's actually a very useful thing for someone who's, if they end up in a survivor situation and someone says, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do, I don't know how to do anything. What can I do? Go around, walk around, you know, within a couple of hundred meters where we go and find some wood that we can burn. That's yeah. dry. Go and 
that. They've yeah. got a job, they go away, they come back, they feel engaged, then we can now get warm and maybe cook something as well. Yes, good point. So, that, so fire, fire, that's a, one of those skills that's worth looking at. The next two, which you love, hunting and fishing. Hunting and fishing, so useful. I mean, they're useful skills at any time, but they're very useful. A lot of the equipment that you get with both hunting and fishing mm. have a lot of other purposes that they can be used for, whether it's growing plants and things, you're using twines, you're using ties. There's a lot of things. But right. if you don't know how to hunt and you don't know how to fish, maybe think about Maybe think about that. Maybe this is the this the, this is the summer. Maybe twenty twenty two is the year where you look, register for a course, do some reading, watch some videos, and go and do a course with someone who knows what they're doing. Right. Really, really useful. And that's something you'll store away, and it's a, then a skill that you've acquired. Whereas it's going to be too late. <laughs> right. To try and learn it when you need to. Yeah. How do I do this? How do I do? Oh, yeah. You haven't got time for that. So, um. First aid. First aid's a really important one. Um, mm. If somebody with you falls, if they've twisted their ankle or you're worried or the, you know, they've got a bad cut or something, do you know what to do? Have you got the equipment? That comes in later with equipment. But do, do you know what to do to help that person or maybe help yourself? Mm. Do you know how to put a tourniquet on? Do you know what you need to think about? I mean, you, obviously, in that situation, if it's a severe injury, you'd love to then take them to the hospital, which is what I hope you're going to be able to do. But this might be a longer term. There are also some excellent, some really good experts online, doctors online and nurses that are that are do survival books. Mm. Um, that's something I, I mentioned part of the equipment is books and videos and knowing what to look at. How do you do this thing? And there's a lot of natural plants and things you can use out there as well. Again, a whole area of skill sets. People who are good with plants that, Huge. that can be used for a whole number of conditions. It's what our great grandparents used to use. It's what they had. Yeah. I'm, I'm just starting to learn about, I mean, my, my wife's a red seal chef and she's, uh, loves gardening and foraging and all the rest. And I always looked at foraging. Who'd want to do that? Right. And then I went out with, uh, with Hank Shaw in Sierra Nevada mountain range and doing some foraging with him. I'm like, this is actually pretty cool. I'm, I'm actually not, I'm pretty good at it. Once people point me in the right direction and tell me what's what, but everywhere you look when you're with somebody like Hank. This is edible. Here's a mustard. This will, here's a type of garlic. Here's a wild onion. And, uh, here's mushrooms that you can eat and you're going to be fine. Yep. Uh, it, it made me realize that there's stuff growing out of the cracks of our sidewalks that is edible <laughs> that yep. we could, that other people would just look at as weeds. Yeah. They don't even see it. It's, right. it's huge. And you know, uh, you, you've, you've probably done more of that than I did. I did stuff where I tried to educate myself about fungi, but it's a huge subject. But if you, particularly with First Nations, they've got such experience of it. Wherever you live in the world, look at the fungi that you have growing and where does it grow? It grows this part of the forest. It's particularly prolific at this time of year. It grows off the, you know, the, the rotting part of this. Right. And it's look above head height. Oh, it's there it is. And, and it <laughs> looks like this, but don't have that one. And it, that once you learn that you see someone who's good at foraging, they go out with a, with a, with a knapsack and they come back with a load of food. It's like they've been to the supermarket. I know. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's, it's definitely cool. And with the fungi, what was an interesting one? There are some out there that, that will kill you. Yeah. Most won't. No. There's a bunch out there that'll make you sick. Yeah. But you still be okay. You're going to live through it. And there's some out there that will be. And, and apparently, allegedly, there's some that you can smoke for recreational purposes as well. <laughs> yes, apparently I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so that's, uh, I talked about first aid, growing vegetables. If you don't mm. know how to grow, if you can't grow anything, learn how to do it. Even if you're in an apartment, you know, learn what you can grow, what you can the things out there that, that work and right. learn what tools you need. Again, that's a whole subject about what you need to do as far as gardening and make this make, let's make 2022 the year where you actually do grow some of your own lettuce or tomatoes or, or, yeah. or zucchini, what grows fast and which parts of the yard or your garden or your house have got the best places, give you the best chance to grow these things. Yeah. That's a good point. So those are good. Um, Food preparation and preserving. Some people don't know how to boil an egg. Yeah, right. You do need to know how to, to do some food preparation. And, and uh, it's you can't just pick the phone up and order in. It doesn't work like that. And preserving food, whether it's pickled or whether it's dry, dehumidified and dried. And yeah. there's a whole w range of ways of doing it. Some great websites on how to do it, what you've got lots of, um, yeah. and how to do it. And There's some... And I'm surprised at how many people don't know how to can food. Yep. 
and I've looked at, I've seen some YouTube videos and some really suspect type, uh, uh, tutorials on how to, how to can your own food, which is only going to lead to bacteria <laughs> growth and some very unhealthy, unhappy people. But the process of it is actually really, really simple. If you, if you just follow the step by step through the numbers and, yeah. um, and dehydrating and, um, uh, like you say, preserving through salting or pickling. It's vacuum sealing is another great one. Yeah. Vacuum sealing is a great way to remove the oxygen. There, that's one of the th the light, the light and the oxygen. How to store products? So store things that whether it's something like lentils or things or rice and things yeah. like that. Store them in a plastic tote where the air's the air's not getting in there, but then the light's not getting in there. It's in a food grade tub. You know, there's there's a whole load of things you can do to give yourself lots of options. Um, what else have I got? Water purification, I mentioned briefly before. Right. It's a skill set yeah. to learn what you need to do, it, how you can how you can purify water. So you've got 10 gallons of water that you think is drinkable because you got it off the roof of the house or it's in, <laughs> um, but how are you going to clean it? How are you going to actually make it so you can drink it and not make yourself really sick? Mm. Um, and then knife and tool sharpening, things like that. If you've got right. a knife or you've got gardening implements or loppers or saws or whatever once it's blunt what are you doing with it have you got any idea how to do that so these are all skill sets you can learn and now's the time to be doing that it doesn't have to be you know it doesn't have to be number one on your priority list but these are all little skill sets that you can pick up i love it well i'm looking at the time right now and i'm conscious of the listener's time and of your time of course and I'll put the question out there. If the listeners are interested in learning more and having Hutch delve into in a deeper way, what he's covered here today, because like he's got one of his binders in front of him right now, there's a wealth of information inside here. If their listeners are interested, let us know in the comments, give an email over. And perhaps we can look at putting some sort of a series together for Silver Core Club members where we, we really get into this. That sounds wonderful. Can I just do a wrap up on things? Oh, can absolutely. I, my final thoughts, I would say, <clears throat> think about getting your affairs in order, everything from uh, um, finances to acquiring skills that we talked about, create your own emergency documents binder that you can have, things like that. And then longer terms, talk about tools, equipment with a, an equipment section would be a separate one. But above all, keep a sense of humor. Don't allow this to dominate your life. It can become a big part of it as you get set up. Right. But keep learning and help others because it's very important that you're not too hard on yourself, but help other people. It could be that the person who lives next door to you, you know, the old saying that it takes a village to raise a child. Right. But in the future, we are a social animal and it could be the guy next door who you don't know particularly well but he might have a really useful skill. He may, might be the guy who does the, your tool sharpening for you. Right. Or you might be cleaning his water for him or showing him how to do it. So be willing to work with people. And uh, then I think people can get through this. That is massive. Is. Hutch, thank you very much for coming on this Silver Core podcast. I really enjoyed this. It's my pleasure. It's been great talking to you, Travis. Thank you. Thank you.